Let's rock! G'day everyone and welcome to another exciting episode of the show where we rip apart TV series and movies and of course uh, it should be a very very exciting episode because it's the start of Discovery Season 3 Episode 1, how good is that? So with me today I've got MPS, how are you dude? Very good, very very um, Lieutenant Commander rank feel about myself today so very good. But I feel so ranked most of, uh, other days. So instead of saying, check you out, we should be just saying, trek you out. So there you go. Anyway, trek is what we're here for today. Season three, Discovery, episode one, That Hope Is You, part one. Oh my goodness, there's more than one part of this exciting episode. We've got a lot to talk about, a lot to talk about regarding this. So uh, let's get a right into it because we know people out there are hanging to find out our thoughts, views and opinions. So I'm going to kick off with MPS. MPS, dude, just very quickly, what are your thoughts? Look, I thought the episode was was uh, fairly good. There were some really awesome parts in it. Uh, I, we'll get to later on. And there were some real parts to it. It was like, guys, please, can you... You've gone that far in the future. Do we have to be so stupid about things, you know? So, uh, but yeah, other than that, I thought it was a, an interesting start uh, to the series. I found that if you're like a lot of people and you ended up having to watch the last episode of season two, just to sort of remind yourself what the hell happened. And of course, the last episode of season two was just like shit going off everywhere. There's, <laughs> there's moving ships and there's explosions and there's Klingons and there's dudes here and, and all this sort of stuff. And it was like, and you sort of forgot how big a deal that was. And then you get to the start of season three and it's like, all that is just completely different. Yeah. It kind of, in that, in that sort of way, it felt a bit flat uh, so that you sort of had all this excitement. And this is what sort of bugged me. Look, we'll start from the start. Uh, the new dude that was sitting in the middle of this building that we had no idea about who we find out is called the attendant, who actually becomes very cool towards the end, um, was just uh, one of those uh, foreshadowings that you didn't, you, you would never see coming. Okay, so that was really, really good. But once she crashes onto the planet, and here we go, people, this is MPS's gripes of, of some of these things, you've got someone who doesn't know it's an M-class planet, has no idea, hits the atmosphere and just takes her helmet off, basically, and strips off and goes, oh, thank God I'm out of that. And, you know, could have been eaten by anything yep. or, or zapped by whatever or just had a face sucked out of the helmet. And it's like, come on, guys, you've got to think you're a little bit better than that okay. it wasn't logical that's what michael burnham should have should have said yes exactly right <laughs> none of that was logical um and then she sends a suit out to the wormhole and destroys it which had to to stop all the bad dudes coming through and everybody else going oh look there's a brand new wormhole here to the beta quadrant let's go and check it out so uh, into the future no less yeah that that they should have thought about that before and that was a bit crazy because now she's got to walk everywhere yep. the fact that she's got to walk you know 500 miles to somewhere with what was like a ration pack of about this big, mm -hmm. you know, it just seemed insane, you know? So, um, yeah, it was a bit heartbreaking though that she couldn't communicate with anyone, but obviously we find out later on in the episode that uh, communication and, and wormholes have a whole different mind of, mindset of their own. And speaking of the locations, I thought they were beautiful. Like they were filmed in Iceland and Canada. And I think that it was internals in Canada and externals definitely in Iceland. Some of that scenery was magnificent. You had beautiful lakes and, and, and rock formations that did look unearthly, and it was just beautiful to watch. That was, that was really well done for those guys. So that impressed me a lot. Very cool. So we had the introduction of the new dude, right, Cleveland Booker. Um, now, I don't know if you noticed this, and I thought maybe this is the way of the world, no, no, you know, a, the brand new way of making movies and TV series, you know, the whole diversity thing kicking in now. But aside from possibly background extras walking past in the market scene there were absolutely no caucasians in this episode at all did you notice that uh, aliens and yeah. obviously other cultures from earth but no caucasians i thought that was an interesting sort of bob um, point to pick up but yeah no i didn't notice that i did notice that there were a few different alien yep. types and they were kind of cool well, speaking Especially of the, the aliens, um, I thought it was interesting. Uh, like um, they introduced the Andorians, right? Uh, sorry again, I'll start with the Orions first. The green dude, right? He was just a random green dude, and I go, 
you know, at least in Enterprise, Star Trek Enterprise, they tried to make the uh, Orions a little bit more interesting, putting metal bits sticking out of their skin and all this sort of stuff. But the Andorians, so they've made them a lot more alien looking, added a lot more facial makeup. But what they've taken out, and I think this is a real loss, is the moving antenna, which they introduced in Enterprise. Mm-hmm. And of course, the idea of the moving antenna was to represent their mood. So if they're like really, really on, on alert, they point forward. And if they're a bit relaxed, they point outwards and all that. And these guys... They, they, their antenna just face forward. And I thought it was a little disappointing. That was actually a backward step from what Enterprise did, even though the facial features were uh, uh, much better. And I also did notice that one of the security guards uh, was of the same race as Morn from DS9. He was just in the background there for a moment. So I um, don't know. They must have had a spare mask floating around. They said, oh, we'll just chuck it on a dude and away we go. But as for the other races, I, yeah, I sort of was trying to pinpoint who they were, but uh, didn't really recognize any of them. Maybe hardcore Trek fans would go, oh, I know what that is. But um, yeah, that's what I saw. Mm. Yeah, I did like the the new facial structure. It made the Andorians look harsher, almost like um, like an evolution type step. But uh, yeah, they certainly they were poking out in all sorts of different places. Like mm. you know, and it was a, a bit sort of weird to see. But obviously, you know, they sort of have to change. The Orions being as dark green as they were was a little bit. It was like oh, yeah, I don't know. As she as she says when she gets interrogated by by those two. Um, oh you're forest green and it's like yeah you're kind of right you are a little bit green under, behind the gills a bit more did than you, normal did you so. even pick up on the line when they said oh, let's go and get a sandwich i'm thinking yeah all the contemporary dialogue has just remained so it's like a thousand years in the future and everybody's still speaking as if they're on earth today yeah and that was another thing that bugged me about it it was like come on guys you had to have changed the dialogue somewhere you know obviously there wasn't as much swearing which um yeah sort of pesters me but at the same time you still got swearing in there you don't need it create something else yeah. you know do you know obviously over and i think i've tried to work out i can't remember if it was 830 years difference or 930 because i heard two different things but still in the year 3 3188 which is what they're assuming earth years are because we're in the same quadrant basically so i don't know how they're still working that out yeah all their their speak and language is the same yeah. And the fact that, you know, all of a sudden she lands on this alien planet 800 years later and they speak English and you go, hang on a second, that that sort of there should have been some sort of other dialogue or dialect or something like that. Well, yeah, I suppose a little bit of alien sort of talking from a couple of other dudes, but you don't want to have the whole thing subtitled, even though for the Klingons, it worked really well in the earlier seasons. Um, I did find it interesting uh that there's the whole discussion about what's happened to the federation the federation has kind of collapsed you know it's like something happened the burn and we've had the burn and like dilithium crystals have all just gone kablooey all over the planet all over the galaxy rather and uh, as a result the federation isn't as powerful as it once was and i thought oh okay it's clearly they're indicating that um this is going to head into a different story even though we're set in the beta quadrant not the alpha quadrant so who knows what's actually happening back on earth but uh, i thought clearly they've dangled a carrot there and of course she's going Tell me what happened, what happened. Of course, the audience is going, well, this is all new for us. Tell us what happened. And, of course, eventually uh, Bookham sort of gets he gets it out and uh, tells everybody what's happened. So uh, even though it happened 100 years prior to him being born, if I recall. So, uh, yes, yeah. into that. Yeah. Well, that makes it interesting because with the Federation gone, she has nothing. Well, they're not gone strictly. They've just lost a lot of their control. And I thought it was interesting. Um, clearly, the whole, whole dilithium explosion thing, um, is has got a story unto itself, and I thought straight away, oh yeah, an invading force from another galaxy, a uh, Delta Quadrant or whatever, not uh, some other quadrant, came in and just destroyed the whole lot. But it doesn't seem to be the case at all. But as they said, they've lost their control. It's not like they don't exist, um, but mm. they're not as uh, influential as they once were, which I thought was actually quite interesting. So. Yeah, and for that reason, the Federation flag has actually changed the design. So instead of having all the thousands of billions of stars all over it like it used to, because it was originally based on the United Nations, uh, it's only got a handful of stars. And I thought, oh, that was interesting at the, as we saw it at the end. So there you go. Yeah. Um, probably one of the biggest thing is that because she's time traveled into the future, right? Uh, and when I, when that occurred, and she lands on the planet, she's talking to the dude and whatever else. And I thought, hang on, we had the temporal Cold War in Enterprise, right? Does this now clash with that? And I was curious to see if they were going to make a reference to it, and they did. Booker said, you know, temporal um, technology had all been outlawed since, you know, the temporal war. And I thought it was good that they mentioned that, but I couldn't be bothered going back to the Enterprise episodes to say, because you had that dude in Enterprise who'd come back from the future. How far in the future did he come from? And does it match up? 
and I'm guess you know mm-hmm. the Trek nerds out there will have to answer this question uh, to say you know the guy who was dealing with Archer and kept bringing him to the future and back again. Um, uh, yeah, does that timeline sort of work? Or have they said in Discovery, no, no, we'll set it after that. That way, from a continuity pers- perspective, uh, it actually works uh, pretty well. So, But I was glad that they at least referenced that because I thought, oh, yeah, this could be a bit of an interesting sort of uh, conundrum. But uh, no, yeah, they seem to have gotten around that one quite well. Yeah. And I like the fact that they outlawed time travel. Yeah. Which means yeah. that in, in theory... If, if Discovery continues on, she can't time travel ever. So she's sort of stuck there. The only, the only issue with that is, it's like, who's controlling the outlawing? They go, we've outlawed time travel. And it's like, and as they've said, you know, with the Federation not there anymore, you know, or there's a lot more unlawlessness going on around the place, then that doesn't stop like Fred from down the road going, well, you know, these guys aren't doing it, but we'll do it. And uh, because clearly time traveling in the Star Trek universe is a bit like going down to your local supermarket. It's pretty easy stuff to do, you know, if you want to pick up some whales or whatever. So uh, you can look at it from that point of view and go, yeah, who's to say that someone else isn't going to bend the rules at some point, you know, some other culture who's uh, like in it for nefarious reasons. So, yeah, I don't know. Interesting. Well, well, all the other cultures did the same thing. Those who did join the Federation were were bound by a set of rules and disciplines, and those who didn't could do whatever they wanted. Yeah. So really, it, it's it's no different. It's just obviously the the Federation doesn't um, have its control, as we mentioned before. You know what I really did like was their personal um, transporters. Yeah. It's like, oh, how good was that? You know, you could just disappear. But my only question is, they have to work on some sort of mind control level because he didn't say anything and they just disappeared yeah and reappeared wherever they wanted to so yeah you're right imagine like the scenario being oh i haven't got my thing wired in properly i go okay quick transport and it's like you haven't set a destination and therefore you just disappear into the ether but yeah i thought that was a very nice sort of evolution of the transporter technology and that's actually the problem with the episode that i found that if you're making it so futuristic now you can actually make it too different and it not feel like Star Trek anymore. Uh, because really, when you watch the episode, it could have been a science fiction show of any type. It didn't have to be a Star Trek show. Aside from a couple of aliens and whatever else, and like the communicator thing, the badge she's wearing or whatever, it could be anything. And um, and that's the thing. When you're so far into the future and you're introducing all this technology that doesn't exist in the prior canon, you do run the risk of alienating your audience and go, you know what? It's just too different because it's just so far in the future. Uh, but yeah, ultimately what I'm trying to say is that Based on this episode alone, most of the Star Trek tropes that we kind of used to just weren't there and it just felt a little bit too far. And even though when Burnham walks into the office with the dude, the Federation guy, and there's just the hint of the Star Trek music, the classic Star Trek music, I thought that was very, very clever, actually. So did you, um, I picked up on this straight away. For some reason, the whole episode had a thing about animals. So you had the budgie at the start with a clock on it. What the hell would yeah. you have a clock on your budgie for, for crying out loud? Yeah, but the bird was holographic. So. Yeah, but that's not the point. Why would you have a clock on a budgie? <laughs> Just have a clock on a clock for crying out loud. Did um, you anyway, notice how it changed anyway. colors? Yeah, I did uh, notice every, that. Yeah, well, different. That was very cool. That was yeah. very cute. Yeah, well, it's got to do something exciting, doesn't it? Um, the dude has a cat. It's good to see cats are still floating around in the well, a thousand plus, actually more than those, like 1,500 years from now or whatever and, it is. And a, and a rancoon at that, one of those big giant pussycats. You see the paws on that thing? It's mancoon, mancoon. not rancoon. 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 If you go, rancoon is the thing that runs around with a big fluffy tail. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, Mancoon. So uh, I reckon, that, and it's got a what is it, like it's got a health issue. I thought that was actually kind of funny. And of course, you got that that trans worm thing that he's carrying around it's in like- his ship. It's like it's almost like Star Trek Four all over again. You know, instead of take out your whales and you put on these big ass worm things and you're trying to save the universe because you know apparently yeah uh, it's, it's all pretty bad in terms of conservation these days. So I thought I'm not sure where they were going with that, but anyway, whatever. All so good. so if I got it right, the cat's name was Grudge. Yeah. So what he was doing was holding a grudge, was he? <laughs> good. I bet that was probably intentional, actually. So uh, there you go. It's probably one of those yeah. jokes that only one producer thought, we'll pop this in and see if anyone figures it out and, yeah. and write it in. No. Nah. Do you know what I, I love when they did get to that sanctuary at the end? The red trees, just like in mm. Into Darkness. Yep. And it was like, yep. I wonder if that was the planet that evolved over 800 years. Yep. It's a good point. It's a very good point. I did notice that as well, actually. So uh, that'll be one for the Trek fans out there to like mull over and get a bit exciting. So we get to the, like the end and we deal with the attendant dude, as you said, right? And I thought, hang on. So this dude's apparently been working for the Federation for 40 years and sitting in this chair every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This person out of absolute nowhere just rocks up and says, hi, I'm Lieutenant Michael Burnham from the Federation. And this guy just swallows it. 
doesn't check any records, doesn't look anything up, just goes, oh, my God, it's a, it's a real Federation person. Doesn't look it up and go, hang on, you disappeared a 1,000 years ago. What are you doing here? <laughs> Nothing like that. And I thought it could have been anybody. Now, we as the audience obviously know who she is. Um, but from the character's point of view, that seemed uh, – that was a little cockeyed. You know, he just swallows a yeah. hook line and think, oh, my God, you're a lieutenant. Quick, ho- hoist the flag and have a whale of a time. You're right. He should have turned around and put up a screen of something and gone – uh, commit, he, he could have actually not been paying any attention to her because unless people are rocking in there all the time. Yep. But he could have still punched in and gone, hang on, you, you disappeared or died. You died. 800 and something years ago. Yeah. What are you doing here? Yeah, we'll have to see where it all sort of transpires in the future. But I mean, he, he wish he could have walked up and said, I, I'm, I'm Lieutenant Michael Burnham from the Federation. And he should have said, oh, Christ, not another one. Another person, another <laughs> wacko coming in here, pretending they're part of the Federation. <laughs> it doesn't exist for crying out loud. Bugger off. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, I guess it is what it is, and I thought, yeah. And yeah, she didn't yeah. even she didn't even have her her badge on at that no. point. That was after no. she took it off. It's like you walk in there, you'd want to strip that jacket off, have your uniform in pristine condition, regardless, and nothing. Now speaking just very very quickly, why is it that on the planet after they get the water scene, good old Booker's out there doing his uh, uh, drying his shirt off, and he's all shirtless and the muscles everywhere, but Michael doesn't have a shirt off. So what? She just <laughs> stayed wet. Or well, she's got the instant drying sort of outfit. And I thought, yeah, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So what's the what's the deal with that? So I thought, uh, what were the directors and the producers thinking at that point? Saying, yeah, we need a a, a, a Kirk homage, you know, get the shirt off, son. And uh, we'll <laughs> have some fun with that. So uh, very, very good stuff. And I don't want to bring up an old, an old chestnut, but uh, because now Discovery is set into the future, like in the distant future, you do wonder, is this set on the prime timeline or the Kelvin timeline? Because... <laughs> There was nothing in there that explained either or either. Now, assuming it's a prime, you know, that's just how it is. But it is open for debate, just like Picard was, this, as in this series. Uh, so it is open to, for debate for those who like to uh, wangle over these little details. So in summary, we have to give uh, give it a wrap up. What do you reckon, dude? So uh, episode one, I forgot what it's called now. Um, uh, the yes. Hope Is You Part One. How did, that, how did it rate for you, old son? Give it five, Out of five stars, what do you reckon? Give us a review. Out of five review. stars. Look, I... Uh... I'm going to say it's about three and a half stars. Ooh, that's three and a half stars. Yeah. Look, it's got some good points. It's It's got some some not so good points. But uh, overall, yeah, three and a half stars. Better than average. Very good. For myself, uh, I thought it's got a long way to go before it really sort of like piques my interest. I said two and a half. So I'm a little bit, uh, yeah, just it's, it's, yeah, especially when I'd watched the previous Undecided. episode of season two. And I go, yeah, that was really good. And I get to this and I go, all right, it's like we've just gone like, like slowed right down. So, uh, but you know, maybe it'll uh, build up and who knows what part two next week uh, we'll have. So uh, you will have to check that out and come back and uh, discuss it further. So any final words on the first episode, season three of Discovery? Oh, I'm actually curious to see what happens in a couple of those instances, but I really can't be bothered with her relationship with that new guy. I'm more interested to see what happens with her and how she survives without eating or having currency or any of that sort of stuff. Uh, and I'm actually curious to see where the, the discovery, the ship actually ended up. Yes. Well, I mean, exactly right. If not for Burnham, if she's turned up and realised the whole plan, the whole situation is completely different, the Federation no longer be there. Imagine the Discovery crew, they're going to go off their nut when they discover what's happened. So uh, we'll have to watch this space. Part two is coming out uh, this week. So, uh, which means we'll be back sometime later this week to uh, give it a bit of a rundown. So I hope you've enjoyed this episode. We're going to nick off now, get ready for some exciting Star Trek action. And we'll catch you in a few days. Okay, take care. See you.